Okay, it's 1.45, so I'm going to get started. So that everyone's very punctual. Thank you for being so punctual. My name is Steve Ray, and I organized our um, Distinguished Lecture Series, which we've been having this semester, and possibly next semester. Um, it's about once a month, and uh, we try and bring in people who will sort of excite your imagination, inspire you, whatever. Some of you may have come to last month. We had our uh, astronaut speaker. So this month, we have Nir Ayal, who wrote a book called Hook, Hooked, which uh, I think will speak to a lot of you. If anyone's thinking of writing uh, software or building a product that you want to engage the user, this is exactly what he's talking about. And uh, we're trying a different model today on our Distinguished Lecture Series. You'll notice he's not standing here next to me. Um, this is an experiment in, in several ways. So we will get a chance to interact with him. But uh, what we're going to do is uh, he has a very nicely produced video we're going to watch. So while you're watching it, you know, think of some good questions and stuff, because he'll be coming online as soon as the video is over for online Q&A. So um, you can either uh, get Lake's attention. Uh, she'll be sort of emceeing the, the Q&A session. Um, or if you want to log into the Adobe Connect session, you can actually put them in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat. So we'll try and feed the, as many questions as we can to him. He'll be online at least half an hour. We'll see how that goes. I'm very excited about this new model, partly because it opens up uh, the possibilities of bringing in some speakers who wouldn't otherwise Either we couldn't afford to bring them out here, or they're too busy, or whatever, so we can maybe get some really world-class speakers next semester, especially, um, if we can make this whole thing work. So a bit of an experiment. So anyway, OK, uh, that's enough of that. Uh, Mark is ready, I know, in the back. And we're going to just queue up the video. It takes a little under half an hour. And uh, think of some good questions so we can uh, give them a hard time afterwards. No. Hi, how are you? Hello. Good. I have hair now, everybody. What do, what do you think? Now I have hair. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, usually it goes the other way. <laughs> yeah. So that's, uh, Mark, can you switch so Anir can see all the audience? Can you switch the screen? OK. All right. Nir, so first of all, thank you so much for spending time with us. I know you're very popular. And uh, thanks for taking time to spend with our students. So what you see here is the one of the classroom. And uh, we have a uh, string in, into a different campus and different classroom right now. So we're going to collect the questions. And Steve's going to help us to, to facilitate and, and then bring up all the questions for you. OK, great. People can put on the chat, or you want to raise your arm. And uh, All right, we have a first question please here. Use, put your, press and hold the microphone in front of you. That'll work either way. Hi, this is Bruno. Thanks for being here. Hi, Bruno with us. Uh, I have a question about the, the trigger to get inside the new product, because it's, it's different when I'm already in uh, Facebook or Instagram scrolling. Then, OK, the, the first time I will use, especially when there are uh, switching habits. For example, uh, VR glasses instead of the control, remote control of my TV. How is that that first uh, trigger, how to, to make that work? Yeah, so, so, uh, so I think what you're asking is, how do you capture the competitor's habit? Or is it more around how do you find the user habit? How do you switch a user habit? Switch a user habit. OK. So this is, this is a tough question, because of course, habits provide a tremendous amount of competitive advantage. right? We all want to be the company that has the consumer habit. It's very difficult to get people to switch a habit. So then the question is, well, what do we, what do, we do? What if somebody else already owns the mental association with that internal trigger? Let's say you're building a product to take on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or WhatsApp or Slack. What do you do if you're the new market entrant? Well, first of all, it's not easy, uh, but there are four ways. I'll, I, and there's, I, I detail this more in my blog. If, if you have a chance, my blog is called nearandfar.com, and I have a whole article that describes this, but I'll give you kind of the very short answer. So the four ways to capture a customer's habit that your competition already owns is number one, we want to increase the frequency of passing through the hook. So if you can figure out a way to get your user to pass through those four steps of the hook more frequently throughout their day, that's one way to capture the customer habit. And this typically happens with a change of interface. 
So when we went from desktop computing to laptops to mobile and then wearable and now to this auditory interface that we're going to see with uh, Apple's uh, AirBuds that are coming out next uh, this month actually and uh, Amazon Alexa, this new voice interface, every time there's a voice, uh, there's an interface that people can engage with more frequently throughout their day, the habit, habit deck gets reshuffled, right? So if you think about, I, I don't know, let's take Facebook for example. When people went from Facebook on their desktops, which is how Facebook was designed, to then Instagram came along and was built for the mobile interface, when they had to make that switch to using on their mobile interface as opposed to on desktop, they could interact with this key experience, this keystone habit of looking at people's photos that they used to do on Facebook now more frequently on their mobile devices because they were carrying around with them every day, right? It, became, it was something that was with them all the time. So they were engaging with it four or five times a day as opposed to just when they were at their, their computer uh, back in their dorm room or something. So number one is frequency. Number two uh, is velocity. So if you can figure out a way to get people to pass through the hook with greater ease, faster than your competition. Good example here, a good case study here is how, how did Netflix beat Blockbuster? If you remember, Blockbuster used to be the, the king of, uh, of video rentals and back then, Netflix came out with these little red envelopes that they would put in the mail. This was before Netflix was a streaming service like it is today. They had these little, you know, DVDs that they would pop in the, in the mail and you and you would, you know, come home from work. Uh, and when the internal trigger was fatigue, was, you know, needing a bit of relaxation, you could either get in your car, drive to a Blockbuster, find the video, check out, drive home, put it in your DVD player, or you would come home and here's this red envelope on your, on your uh, kitchen table, and how much easier, how much quicker could you pass through the four steps of the Netflix hook versus having to go get a video at Blockbuster. So just that dramatic ease of going through the hook with greater velocity is another way to capture the competition's habit. The third way is to make the reward more rewarding. And there's been a, lot of, uh, uh, there's been a few studies now that show that you can't make your product just a little bit better it actually has to be nine times better, according to a, a famous HBR article that's a few years old now. But what, what, what the surveys are telling us is that your product has to be dramatically better. It can't just be a little bit better. So if you think about, let's take, uh, why did Facebook offer Snapchat $3 billion to buy Snapchat? Now, you know, they got rebuffed. Now uh, Snapchat looks like it's going to IPO next year. Why is Snapchat such a competitive threat to Facebook? Well, if you think about it, if you were going to receive a message right this second, let's say you receive two messages right now, and one of those messages came on Facebook, and one of those messages came on Snapchat, which message would you open first? I'm betting, for those of you who have tried Snapchat, you're going to open Snapchat first. Because Facebook, the message is probably from your Aunt Matilda, Versus on Facebook, uh, on Snapchat, that message is going to come from someone who you've been flirting with, and it, the pictures explode. So what's going to be in that that message is going to is probably going to be more interesting, flirty, funny. The reward is going to be more rewarding. So that's the third way that you can capture a customer habit. The fourth way, uh, and this doesn't have to so much do with engagement; it has to do more with onboarding. The fourth way is if you can make entering the hook easier. So a good, a good case study here is if you think about, uh, it used to be that the most widely used enterprise software in the world was Microsoft Office. It no longer is. The most widely used enterprise software in the world today is Google Docs. How did Google Docs win? Well, uh, when Google Docs was first uh, unveiled, it did a fraction of what Microsoft Office could do, but it had a couple of huge advantages that made starting to use Google Docs much, much easier to do. You could get into the hook easier. Number one, it was free. It was hosted in the cloud. And there was no software to install. So if you're a college student, if you're a person starting a company and you just need a, a good word processor or, or a spreadsheet software, which one made it easier to start using in the first place? Of course, it was Google Docs, even though it did a fraction of what, uh, of what Microsoft Office could do. So those are the four ways, frequency, velocity, make the reward more rewarding, or easy in to the hook. Hi, so, so my question is, I noticed that many companies with successful products feel a need to try and jam 
more and more into the product, which makes the interface more and more complicated and add more features and to change the interface, which would seem to argue against what you're talking about. <clears throat> so Microsoft Word gets more and more complex every year and bigger, <clears throat> if not better. Um, TurboTax changes its user interface every year. Facebook is now wants to have news feeds and videos and everything, so, so it becomes much more complex. So if you like movies or you like other things, getting to what you want becomes actually harder and not easier. Are those companies all making a mistake? Uh, so I would, I would take issue with uh, the bigger and better. Uh, I, I think that this is a classic path of, uh, of products that lend themselves to be disrupted. They t this happens again and again and again. They over-engineer, they overbuild the product, and then they're blindsided when somebody comes out with a product that's dramatically easier to do just one thing, just one habit better. Uh, I think all of these companies, they start with one simple keystone habit. And then once they have that hook established, they layer on additional habit onto that keystone habit. And what tends to happen is that many companies, unless they're careful, unless they're smart, tend to do what, what you're saying, right? So they layer on more features and more buttons and more options, which decreases the, the, the velocity with which a user can go through the hook, particularly new users. A lot of companies, I see this all the time, they listen to their most loyal users and they forget what their first user experience looks like. This happens all the time. And, that, and that's a mistake. And that leaves you, uh, that, that leaves you uh, open to disruption. So you, I think you mentioned personal finance. And when you think of the story of, uh, of Intuit's Quicken being disrupted by Mint. I mean, Mint.com did a frat. They had to ultimately buy Mint.com because it was such a, a disruptive product. Mint.com still to this day does a fraction of what Quicken could do. Quicken was, was by, by far the most widely used uh, personal finance software. But it got so cumbersome, it got so bulky, it got so difficult to use because of they were building it for their best users as opposed to building it for new users. That when new users were faced with this decision, do I use this or that, the one that was more complex lost. And so we see this time and time again. It's called bundling and unbundling. Uh, and we see this happening with personal technology all the time. And let's do this because uh, we also have students online ask questions. Steve, what are the questions? Actually, this first one I wanted to ask is by uh, Kobe, which is kind of a follow-up to what you said, is actually wondering if you have any more actual evidence about this issue of complexity. The more complex, the less likely they are to ask. Are there any studies you have uh, knowledge of? Well, I think we see this in uh, the design of all sorts of products and services. I mean, uh, um, we know that uh, increasing cognitive load. I mean, I would refer you to the work of B.J. Fogg. He's kind of the, the, the granddaddy. Of, he's not that old, but he's, he's kind of the, uh, the, 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 our guide. I would call myself a disciple of B.J. Fogg. And a lot of his work at Stanford in the, in the uh, Captology lab, uh, he founded this field of Captology, uh, which is all about how computers, uh, assistive devices change our behaviors, how they are persuasive computers. Um, and I think, you know, he, he's building off the work of, of Lewin, and Lewin is a, uh, a psychologist, uh, you know, lo long gone, but uh, who, who told us that uh, people's behavior is a function of the person in the environment. Uh, and, and so this is, this, you know, nothing in my book is new. Uh, it's a reformulation and a new application of very old science. Um, you know, Lewin is over 100 years old. Uh, Skinner is 1950s, 1960s. Uh, if you look at... Um, uh, Bandura's work. This is all very old stuff. Uh, this is, you know, the kind of the backbone of of uh, psychology research, let alone consumer psychology research. And so, this idea that the more friction we put in front of people, in general, decreases the likelihood of them doing the behavior. Uh, that's that goes back to Lewin's equation, and then Fogg put it into B equals M A T. Uh, so we see this time and time again when it comes to the application of your specific product. I mean this. You know, where the rubber hits the road here and, and where my discipline comes in is, is from actually to actually making products and services, you know, what, what I always advise people is to test, right? This is, this is the beauty of building technology in the age we live in today is that you don't have to ask a guru. Uh, all you have to do is ask your customers. So we can A-B test uh, these theories 
And so the idea behind the hook model is to give us some kind of framework that we can work from when we try and build customer hypotheses, when we come down to this fundamental question that was the hardest part about building my two companies was always this question of what do we build next? And so answering that question through some kind of framework based on old established psychology research saves us a lot of time and money, uh, right? If we can make sure that we have these five fundamental questions answered, we're not shooting in the dark. We're not building just what our bosses say we should build. We're not building even what the customer says we should build without first running it through this, this model. Uh, but fundamentally, we have to test it uh, because uh, you know that that's, that provides us the greatest evidence towards what should be in our product and what should not be in our product is this rapid iteration cycle that we today can do very cheaply and very quickly. All right, one more question from online. Okay, yeah. uh, we have a couple I'll sort of summarize and blend together, which was, could you give a few more examples on the, in the physical space and the services space besides on the software side? Yeah, so, so physical space, it's, it's a little bit tricky because uh, it's hard to complete the four steps of the hook. Uh, uh, so many of the products in the physical space um, have just three parts of the hook. They don't have the investment phase because they're not interactive. Um, so what, what we're going to see in the future through the Internet of Things is that everything is going to have that investment phase built in. Uh, my focus of study is really about how to build tech products. Uh, but when you think about other habits, right, you, you, you have a habit with your coffee machine, but if a new coffee machine comes along that has a little bit better features, a little bit better specifications, that coffee machine's out the door. Whereas, and, and traditionally, when it comes to physical products, uh, these are things that when the next best thing comes along, we replace the old product. The reason I'm so fascinated by habit-forming technologies, and particularly these products that have all four steps of the hook, is that when it comes to this industry, the best product doesn't win. That's a, that's a really big deal. That many times people will keep using the worst product because they have invested in it. I mean, think about sites that require a lot of investment. Uh, when you accrue, remember that, that investment phase I talked about in the video, when you have a lot of Twitter followers, when you have a lot of Facebook friends, when you've given a company a lot of data, when you have a very good reputation, all of these things make it so that when the next product or service comes along to compete with you, it's very difficult for the competition to swoop in and take your customers away because they've invested so much in your product. And so physical products that don't ask for investment, don't get better and better and better with use are easily disrupted. Uh, and I think I think that's uh, that's why building for habits is such a competitive advantage that, uh, that that you are able to build this moat around your product the more it is used. Okay, um, actually, I have a question here. So Neil, we use your book to uh, to teach product management. So actually, your book is the only textbook I recommend to my students. Um, Thank you. So. Uh, so it's a, it's a great book. So uh, I just want to talk about a little bit. Of the, the, after reading the book, the assignment I give to my students is the engagement challenge of Pokemon Go. So we have already seen Pokemon Go has uh, done really well uh, in the last, well, I would say, when the first two months when it came out. It's very strong stickiness, strong engagement. However, it dropped about 70%, I, I believe, even more after the, the, yeah. today. So in your perspective, what did Pokemon Go do wrong? And if you were the product manager, what would you do? Right. So by the way, that, that video you saw, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, that folks read the book because there's obviously a lot more in the book that I could have time for uh, in the video. One of the things that actually relates to the question that the gentleman just asked uh, is that I want to be very clear. Not every business needs to be habit forming. There are plenty, just because you, 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 you um, uh, you know, there's lots of businesses that can provide value to their customers, to their shareholders, to their employees without building a habit. You can attract customers using advertising, using search engine optimization. You could have a physical storefront on the corner. All of these ways are perfectly good ways to bring customers back. It's just that certain types of companies, companies whose business model requires a habit, those companies need a hook. Right. If you think about it, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Pokemon and all of these products, 
they could not exist without a habit. If you don't come back on your own, the business model doesn't work. They can't afford to spend ads. So it's not that I'm saying that this is magic pixie dust, that every product and service, everything needs to be habit forming. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying that those products that need to be habit forming need to have a hook. Okay, so now I'll get to your question about Pokemon. So Pokemon Go demonstrates a really fascinating uh, application of the hook because they, they do have a hook built into that product. Very engaging at first. But there's one interesting phenomenon uh, that you see specifically with games and a few other industries. And that is this problem of finite versus infinite variability. Let me explain. How many of you, I can, I can see you down there, but how many of you remember Farmville? You, you all remember Farm? Anybody played Farmville back in 2008? Okay, a lot of you, I see. So Farmville back in 2008 was the fastest growing game in history. Okay, everybody was playing Farmville. It was a, it was an international phenomenon, kind of like Pokemon Go was a few uh, weeks ago, a few months ago. Nobody's playing Farmville anymore. What happened? Why, why isn't anybody in the room, I bet, still playing Farmville? Well, let's, let's take a look at Zynga. It's a very interesting case study. So Zynga, company used to be worth $10 billion. Now it's worth uh, about 90% less than that. They released this game, Farmville. Huge hit. And then the next game that they released, does anybody remember what it was? It, it was Chefville. And then Frontierville. And then Farmville 2, and then the next Ville, and the next Ville, and the next Ville. And what the people started to discover, what players started to discover, that it was the same game again and again and again. And what was once variable became predictable. And so now you see the problem. That the rewards phase of the hook has to be a variable reward. There has to be a bit of uncertainty around what the customer might find the next time they engage with the product. So for a product that scratches this internal trigger of boredom, that's what games do, they, they entertain us, if the game is somehow becomes more predictable with use, with play, that's an example of finite variability. And that is exactly what I predicted would happen with Pokemon Go, and it's exactly what is happening with Pokemon Go, because they're not changing the game. So the game isn't variable anymore. You play it once, you play it twice, you play it three times, you get the idea. It's not variable anymore, it's predictable. What they should have done, and what I think is going to come with the next update, is social rewards. Right now they only have rewards of the hunt. And after you capture those rewards of the hunt, you kind of get the idea it's not that exciting anymore. What they should do is have people interact with each other to utilize rewards of the tribe, as well as these rewards of the hunt and rewards of the self. Uh, so that's the Pokemon, and with all games, and by the way, this is something that's endemic to book publishing, right? You read a book, how many books do you finish and then start right back at the beginning? Almost never. How many movies do you see more than once? Almost never. Uh, the, we read the news. We don't go back and read the newspaper again and again. No, no, no. We throw out the newspaper. We want the next day's news. These are businesses that have to constantly crank out new, 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 new as part of their business model. And they can't rest on their laurels. I think what Zynga did and what, uh, what, what uh, the people who make Pokemon Go are doing is that they're expecting the game to be variable forever, but it's not. Uh, it's not like a social network. It's not like products that constantly remain variable that have infinite variability. These products have finite variability. So they have to be established as a studio model, a publishing house, a movie studio. These companies are constantly creating new, new, new content uh, because they realize that that's what keeps people engaged. Great, thank you. I have a follow uh, another question. I want to take an angle on your your final remarks having to do with uh, ethics and morality, and yeah. not even addressing the issue about morality on the habit forming, if you like, addiction, but more about the fact that these all represent um, customizable experiences, which are going to speak to you, your own reinforcement, your own investments, etc. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on responsibilities where um, we tend to have uh, less in common with each other. And what I'm thinking, you might imagine, is things like the Facebook experience where you get the self-reinforcement of what you want to hear and what you like. Right. And uh, we find ourselves uh, moving away from each other. And that eventually might corrode society. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. 
Yeah, you know, I think it's a it's a it's a very good question. Uh, since Tuesday, uh, I have been doing a lot of soul searching, and uh, this is something that I've been thinking about quite a bit. Uh, and I think where I come down on this, and so this answer isn't fully formed, so I want to make sure that, that, that you know that I don't have all the answers. I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking out loud here. But when it comes specifically to this, this question of, of the, the filter bubble, the echo chamber that many people have commented on, I guess what we need to first ask is, what's different? What's changed? that wasn't the case before because remember people people don't live in a vacuum and so we need to we need to think about this question in the context of a historical perspective and so i i'm not sure that the boogeyman of this election that people are saying it was facebook's fault that uh, that hillary didn't win the presidency i i think that's a knee-jerk reaction that is 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 looking for a scapegoat frankly because you'll remember People have always been isolated. And if anything, they're less isolated today because they have access to information on the internet and other sources. It's not like people only use these, these, uh, these mediums as their only sources of information. And remember, you know, when I uh, voted in my first election in 1996, uh, the big boogeyman of the day was cable news. And that was making people uh, enter the echo chamber of only watching cable news and talk radio. Rush Limbaugh was the big controversy of the day. It was, it was Rush Limbaugh that, uh, that, that created uh, you know, these echo chambers because people only listened to, to him. And even before that, it was your local newspaper. And if you remember during the days of yellow journalism over 100 years ago, I mean, you had the Yiddish newspaper and the Catholic newspaper. So media tailored to its audience has always been here. That's not new. Uh, and in fact, geography is the greatest divide, is the greatest echo chamber, because, you know, Sunday is the most segregated day of the week, because black people go to black churches, and Presbyterians go to Presbyterians, and Jews go to their temples. And so people get their information, they listen to different sermons all the time. Now, I don't think that's necessarily a problem, because I think people are pretty smart. Right? I think by and large, granted, there are people who are not so smart. It exists in society. It's part of, uh, uh, of having diversity of thought and, and people who don't agree with you and people who maybe are not, don't have the faculties to, to, to think through things the way other people might think through things. But in general, by and large, I think that, this, that, that, that more information, more access, more freedom is a good thing. And yes, we have, we have, uh, we have bumps along the way, but I think the historical trajectory is that things are moving in the right direction, that these things are good for us, uh, that I think they do make us more informed, and that I think people generally seek out uh, truth. They want to see uh, others' opinions. Of course, not, not always, not every person, but by and large. And so I'm not, I'm not as convinced that the, the, the scapegoat of this, uh, this election should be uh, products that, that get better with use. Because remember also, what's the alternative? Right? What, what, do we want products to not get better based on our feedback? Do, do we want to, uh, companies to, to, to just give us whatever they think we want? Of course not. I mean, the natural evolution of products uh, evolving for the customers, what I call this phenomenon of contingency, is, is a good thing. It's how products get better and better. So I can't say that that's a complete analysis, but I think that uh, overall, uh, that the that the the trend line is is moving in a positive direction. Okay, we have another question over there. Hello. Okay. Hi, uh, my question is regarding priority importance. So when you say when you set out to develop a habit, I don't know if it really makes sense, but when you set out to develop habits, do you follow the the cycle of the hook? Like you have to have a trigger first, and then action, and then reward, or are there different levels of importance based on your service or the product you are producing? I see. So if your product does not require a habit, you don't need the hook model. Now you can pick and choose. If your product is something that's used not frequently enough to form a habit, you can say, look, let's look at just the, uh, the, the, the triggers. Let's figure out, is the action simple enough? Are we rewarding the user appropriately? Are we asking for investment? You can use that piecemeal. But if you're building a habit forming technology, if you're building a product that requires people to come back on their own, 
then you've got to have all four steps of the hook in place. And so the, the, where this is useful is in two phases, either very, very early in a product's life cycle. So meaning before any code has been committed, before any designs are made, just a, 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 in the paper sketch uh, phase of, product, of a product design, a, a product idea, that's when we would want to figure out, okay, if the product needs people to come back on their own, if that's a requirement of the business, and again, not every product has to be habit forming, but if our product must be habit forming, how do we answer these five mm -hmm. fundamental questions in these four phases of the hook? That's when it's most useful. The second place it's useful, and this is not as much fun, is when the product's not engaging. So I'll get uh, every month or two, I'll get uh, calls from VCs that will call me and say, look, we just put a bunch of money into this company. It was growing like crazy, but nobody's sticking around and we can't figure out why not. And so it's a diagnostic tool. We can look at the existing product and ask ourselves five fundamental questions of the hook to figure out where it might be breaking down. Okay. Yeah. Maybe Thank next uh, online question. Oh. I don't know, Nir, if you can see these online chat questions, but I'm trying to paraphrase the very last one here. Sure. Um, is really talking about the user with the investment model versus the actual product creator um, having a counterpart uh, equivalent concept to the investment. Uh, I don't know. I'll Let's give you a moment here. Really. Later. Okay. Uh, sh shooting's question, right? Uh, I'm not sure if I, if I understand the question. Uh, is there? Okay. How about this? We uh we give shooting some time to uh to verify the questions, and then we move on to the to the site. Okay. Hi. Uh, Nick, thank you for your book. It's really helpful. Like, if you have to build a habit forming product, I just had a question that is there any book which defines where the fine line is like you know where should you stop creating a habit which is very addictive because uh like mm. see snapchat is very hit and like you know 70 percent of teenagers spend 80 percent of their time on snapchat that's very good for snapchat but is that good in general like i mean yeah. as product managers we should have some responsibility before releasing a product not just making it habit forming but to ensure that we don't cross that fine line. Right. So uh, in the book, you remember the chapter that's called Morality of Manipulation. I talk about the difference between an addiction and a habit. And uh, uh, that word addiction, uh, people use inappropriately. And there's a, there's a very distinct reason that I did not call my book How to Build Addictive Products. It's, ca it's called How to Build Habit-Forming Products. Because the definition of an addiction is a persistent compulsive dependency on a behavior or substance that hurts the user. So the definition of an addiction is something that you want to stop doing, but can't. Okay? So it has to harm you in some way, and you have to want to stop doing it, but can't. Okay? Um, I like to eat chocolate cake. Um, I like my work. I like to have sex. But I'm not a sex addict. I'm not a food addict. And I'm not a workaholic. So clearly, it's not the product itself that is addictive. It's the interaction between the person and the product that makes an addiction. So the science of addiction is something that I think um, a lot of people don't dive into enough, and they kind of just throw the word around. But you know, an addiction is 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 a is a uh, is a disorder. It's not something that you can just all of a sudden catch. Now, what, what, what is indicative of this disorder is an inability to cope with reality, an, a need for an escape from an uncomfortable reality. Now, to some extent, that is part of, uh, of habits as well, that when we feel these internal triggers, we seek an escape. The difference is to what extent does it harm us? And so I would, I would conjecture that for the vast majority of people, uh, Facebook and Twitter and yes, even Snapchat are not harmful, right? These aren't necessarily products that that hurt people. And again, back to the, what I said earlier about that that we have to consider this uh, holistically that people don't operate in a vacuum. What's the alternative? 
right? The, the, when, when people take issue with people, you, the kids these days using Snapchat or, or Facebook, my, my, uh, you know, my um, rebuttal is what's the alternative? The average American today spends five hours a day, on average, five hours a day, you heard that right, watching television. And frankly, I would much rather have people interacting in some sort of interactive medium than you know, staring uh, passively at, at a screen. So by and large, I don't think these products hurt the vast majority of people. They don't addict people. They might be habit forming. And at times people do go overboard and I'm included. Part of the reason I love studying what I study is that you know, as my friend Gretchen Rubin says, she says, uh, research is me search. And so I sometimes find myself overusing these products, but that's because they're so good, right? I sometimes will eat too much chocolate cake. Sometimes I will have a glass of wine too many. Sometimes I'll spend too much time on Facebook. But that's not necessarily an addiction. That's just because these things are fun to use and sometimes we overuse. Now, I am just as much of a proponent. The video that I'd love for you all to watch next is if you go to my blog and you type in unhooked, unhooked, you'll see a video very similar to the one you just saw, which is a 15 minute presentation on how to break unwanted uh -huh. habits. So, so I'm just as much of an advocate for business as I am for breaking unhealthy habits. And, and this is, if you look at my writing on my blog, literally half of my writing is about how to put technology in its place, how to break unhealthy habits. But just to be clear, these aren't necessarily addictions. Now, let me just really quickly talk about addiction. There will be always, always, a, a product that is used by a sufficient number of people will attract addicts. It's just the nature of the world, that one to 5% of the population has a psychographic profile towards addiction, and people get addicted to all sorts of things. If you've ever seen the television show Intervention, amazing television show, very sad, people get addicted to uh, sniffing glue. They get addicted to biting their fingernails. They get addicted to uh, there's a uh, they get addicted to balloons. They get addicted to all sorts of things that the makers of those products did not intend people to get addicted to. The silver lining here, the reason I'm optimistic, is that unlike traditional products, where the manufacturer has no connection to the user, right? Consider alcohol. Alcohol addiction has been around for a very long time. But if you're an alcohol distiller, you can throw up your hands and say, well, we don't know who the addicts are. How do we know who's addicted, right? And you'd be right. You have moral cover in that fact. However, if you're Zynga, if you're Facebook, if you're Twitter, if you're whatever, you name it, these companies have personally identifiable information on each and every user, which means that the upside of all this data we're giving them is that when someone needs help, when someone is using a product to an extent that it is hurting them, these companies have the ability and I believe the moral responsibility to reach out. So I've been having meetings with Snapchat, with Reddit, with Facebook. I'm having meetings with these companies literally the past couple weeks to, to implore them to, to create what I call a use and abuse policy that says if you use this product, a number, just give me a number, right? 20 hours a week, 30 hours a week, whatever it is, we're going to have that number as, as, a, as a, uh, uh, a breaker that says, if you use the product this many hours a week, we're going to reach out to you and see if you need help and see if we can help you moderate your use. If you say to us, look, I am having trouble. I'm using this more than I think is good for me. Help me cut down. Then those companies have a re ethical responsibility to do that. But again, remember, that's addiction, which is very, very different from a habit because the real problem here Okay? The reason I wrote this book and the reason I keep doing the work I do, the real problem is not that a few companies that people remember, like Snapchat and Facebook and Instagram, these companies that we can count on one hand, have done it so well. The real problem is that the vast majority of products out there are horrible. There are so many products and services out there that the makers want to help people live better lives. They have created these products to help people lose weight to uh, connect with their family members, to live happier, healthier lives, uh, to, to save money. All of these products and services, the makers have the best of intentions, but because of poor design, nobody uses it. That's a tragedy. The real problem is not that a few companies do this really well. The real problem is that not enough companies have read my book and actually have designed products that people want to use. So there's two types of manipulation. 
There's persuasion and there's coercion. Persuasion is when we help people do things they want to do. Coercion is when we get people to do things they don't want to do. I don't know how to do coercion. I don't advocate for coercion. Coercion is unethical. Persuasion, however, is an obligation of a company to give people what they want, to make their life better by helping them do things they want to do. So this is manipulation. We have to be careful about how we implement it because it does work. But I think that over the long run, that using, uh, using persuasion improves people's lives far more than it hurts them, especially when we take into account uh, doing something for the addicts. Great. We have, uh, OK, so I think uh, Xu Qing online that um, uh, validated that the question is, can product owners control the investment part of the hook? How? Can they, <laughs> how can they? How can they control the investment part of the hook? I, I think the biggest mistake, what most companies do, is that they don't ask for investment in the first place. And that's, that's the biggest problem I see. I think a lot of companies uh, make, design the product with just the first three parts, right? Identify what people want, make it easy for them to get what they want, and give it to them. And that's great. That's, that's fantastic, right? You're making something people want. But the biggest mistake is not asking for the investment in the first place. And, and to be honest, it wasn't so easy to do as it is today, uh, right? When we think about the fact that things made out of atoms, as opposed to things made out of bits, mm -hmm. depreciate. They lose value over time. And so the vast majority of products can't get better with use. They have to, we have to do focus groups. And we have to do customer research. That's the only way that the manufacturer can make the product better. And that takes years. But today, we can make products better in real time if we ask for data, if we accrue investment, if we make the products better and better with use. That's what the investment phase is all about. OK, when you say data, then there's a typical qu data question is like garbage in, garbage out. So how do you collect the right signals and the right data? Right, so it's, it's, it's the kind of data that, that uh, co-create the product. So if you think about Pinterest, for example, uh, if you think about mint.com, you know, Pinterest, if you were to log into my Pinterest account, it actually wouldn't be very interesting for you because I've co-created the product based on the data I've given the company. I've told the company what kind of things I like to collect. And so they keep serving me things that I think that they think might be interesting for me. Right. And so that's, that's the kind of data I'm talking about, the kind of data that makes the product better with use. Okay, so you can pull it from the users. Okay. All right, any other questions? OK, All right, one more question. Did, did we get the question? I saw here that there's some more questions online that I didn't get to. Uh, we, got those, but we got another verbal question here. Oral. Sure. Hey, it's Bruno again. Uh, I'd like to know about the, the mechanism they use to engage the user, like like button. That's very common. Should the, the product have that, or uh, it can be uh, should it have there? It's something that you need to have. It's something that you can improve your product, or something everybody's doing. Show so try to find something else. So I, I think the like button is one way uh, to collect user investment. It doesn't have to be the only way, right? There's lots of different ways to to collect customer data based on uh, what they what they follow, what they comment on. Uh, there's passive data collection and there's active data collection. For example, every time you use Google. When you're logged in, when they know who you are, the product gets better with use. They, they track based on what you've done in the past. That data goes into informing your search results in the future. If you don't believe me, go to uh, open your, your browser, your Chrome browser in incognito mode and start searching around and then compare that, those search results to what you might find when you search in, uh, when you're signed in and you'll see different results. The product is passively collecting data about your click trail. And that, that is a way of the product getting better and better with use. So there's both active uh, data collection or data uh, forms of investment and passive forms of investment through data collection. All right, I think we're uh, running out of time. So uh, thank you so much, Nir. That was this great speech and great QA sessions. And thank you, everyone. <laughs> we're looking forward to, for you to come back next year. My pleasure. And just what I'll type in my, uh, you might have it already, but here, I'll type in my, uh, my URL for my blog. Um, 
If you have any questions in the future that uh, I didn't get to, I do office hours actually every week with readers. There's a little bit of a wait, unfortunately, but if you have a question for me uh, that we didn't get to today or you think of later, I'm always happy to hear from you, especially folks who have read my book. That's a huge compliment that you've uh, taken the time to do that. And so if you have questions along the way, please feel free to book office hours with me. You go to my blog, there's a little thing in the right-hand corner that says schedule time with me, and uh, you can book time with me for free. It doesn't cost a thing. Just happy to hear from you. So nearandfar.com. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good morning. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming.